There we go, right, I'm going to do my little intro, hang on, right, oh, oh, here we go. Hello, welcome to Unity 151, my name is Joe. On this channel, I do weekly reviews of, which I don't do weekly now, I've changed that, of sci-fi, midget sci-fi, space opera. I do a weekly live writing journey video where a few of us talk about what we're learning as aspiring writers, but sometimes I get actual authors who come on and talk about the writing side so of, of writing and stuff, um, which I've got Scott Barlett here. Um, I do author interviews as well, which Scott Barley did last week. So if you want to watch that, go find it. That was a really, really good um, uh, interview. We spoke about spaces and um, some of the old books and some new interesting stuff that's coming as well. So go do that. Uh, yeah, as I said, today is um, the Ryan Live one. So Scott's going to talk about stuff you know that you don't really know when you're reading a book, what goes into it, stuff that can help us as new people or experienced people who've been watching it. That's, that's it, really. So, Scott, hey, on, hey. how have you been this week? Tell us about yourself and what you've been up to. I'm good. Thanks for having me on again, Joe. I really enjoyed last week. Good to be back. Yeah, I, I'm so – thank you. Thank you for coming back. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, my week's been pretty straightforward. We're, uh, we're sent into to lockdown where I am again, so I've been living that life, which for, luckily for an indie author doesn't make a tremendous difference in terms of the, the work that we have to do. So, uh, yeah, I've been just trying to get my chapter in a day. And uh, other than that, I've been working on a lot of admin stuff and also editing for myself. And right after I finish editing that, I'm going to transition into editing uh, my, my next co-authored book with Joshua James. So there is no shortage to the editing, as always. Not my favorite part of uh, writing, but it's uh, it's got to get done. Yes, no, definitely. Um myself what have i been doing i just i actually i've I done a it's a short um it's like a little audio drama -y little thing that i've done um where it's like i've, I've got a story that i've written, written up to about five uh five minutes worth of a little story of more of like a talking about history like something that happens an event uh, my partner has done the voiceover now when you think oh partner done the voiceover it's gonna be terrible she has a really good voice she's done like amateur dr dramatics for a while and she's really good at it so she can actually talk like correctly where i'm I can't, I'm terrible. Um, so I released that yesterday, and that's done really well. It's up to 56 views in 20, just over 24 hours, which is really, really good. Um, I've had positive feedback on it. I've just finished editing the second part. It's a free part of that is. Um, bar one sentence, she just needs to re um, reread it because there's a bit of a, a mess up in a word. Uh, then I've got the third one to do at some point um but that's that i haven't done no writing or anything it's been um sort of doing tidying and doing a lot of stuff at home be a bit more world building this week for myself um and youtube stuff that's pretty much my week really not really yeah not as good as you pumping out a chapter a week a day i mean i've uh i've actually listened to the the first little bit of joe's audio drama and uh from, from what i heard so far sounds very professional so if you haven't checked it out yet and you're watching make sure Please do give me constructive criticism because I, I need to know what you think, what you don't think. If it's terrible, or not because you know <laughs> you don't learn until unless people tell you. I've, you know, it's true, that's, very that's true. It, really. Mm. Um. So today's episode, what we're going to talk about? There's a few things that Scott's brought up, and if we add things in, whatever we will. But he wants to talk about uh, what was it? How to stay motivated? How to structure a launch? That's all right. I couldn't read my spelling then. Um, oh, how to make, how to get elements in place for self publishing? Why marketing starts before word one? And if there's anything else that comes to mind, and I'll ask questions and pick brains to try and learn as much because I'm learning. I'm a learner. He's the teacher. That's it. So, do you, where do you want to start then? So it's all in your hands now. This is where I'll be quiet and just not. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, maybe let's uh, let's talk a little bit about how how we stay motivated. Uh, a, a big breakthrough that I've made really in, in just this past year has been trying to while, while I'm writing, just making a concerted effort to eliminate all distractions during that time. So whatever time I've set aside to you know do my chapter or whatever, I want to make sure that I'm I'm off social media and that my phone is turned off. And it's, you know, in a different room if it needs to be. And uh, I even go so far as to listen to music that's uh, with no lyrics in it. That's kind of like calming and make sure that's not like getting in the way of the, of the, the writing brainwaves. And, 
Yeah, sometimes I don't even listen to music at all. Sometimes it's just total, total focus on the uh, writing. Another thing that I'm finding is helping me. I mean, this has helped me for, for a good many years, but is sort of having a vision for where you're going to go with a book. So this ties into, say, outlining, you know, knowing where the book is going, knowing what purpose each chapter is meant to serve. So you know what you're working towards with what you're writing rather than you know, just sitting there and staring at a blank page, which I've done more than I care to admit. Uh, and uh, I've sort of kind of brought that to the next level in the past year or two. And uh, I'll, I'll take like probably an hour beforehand or so, you know, sometimes half hour, sometimes longer. But uh, just to sort of conceptualize the chapter in my head and think about what would be cool in this chapter, what characters do I have in it, what's the what's the scene what's the setting uh what are some compelling details that i can think of right now even before i start to write about how to ground uh write the reader in the chapter and things like that you know am i establishing character am i establishing theme whatever and in some sort of direction in mind uh before i even start writing so that way i've got a lot of it figured out and i can mostly when i finally sit down just focus on prose and it's a lot less likely that you're going to get like discouraged or whatever. Do you ever like if, if like say one chapter sort of missed a bit or something and you feel it needs it, would you try and add it or would you sort of think the next chapter I'll try and add that to it? Because obviously the, the chapters already follow on as long as like the, it's like the story's making sense and you're not jumping to someone else. Would you sort mm -hmm. of add something to the next chapter because you are missing it, but you don't want to cram too much into one chapter? You know what I mean? Yeah, sometimes, like if I've written a chapter and I realize that I should have included something in that chapter, uh, I'll, I'll write a little note. And uh, I use Scrivener, so I don't know if you're familiar with Scrivener, but uh, it, it's great for this because you can kind of like create a little sub file underneath each individual chapter. So say chapter nine is missing something that I forgot to include. I'll just create that sub file and I'll write a little note to self for when I'm going back through and editing it to go back and, and add that in. But uh, yeah, a lot of the times, like a, I'll have like a bigger idea for a chapter that, but then I get into writing it and I realize, wait a second, that this is what you to cram into one chapter, whether it's because not enough time is gonna pass in the story for in order for this to properly happen, or it's just like a lot to uh, pack in, or it's gonna like pacing negatively, or this character is gonna need some time to regroup and process before they, they take this action. And there's a number of reasons why it might be too much to fit into a given chapter, but yeah, that, then I will at least move that ahead to the next chapter that features that character. And of course, as you know, with space here, I got a bunch of different point of views and they kind of like ping pongs back and forth between them. So maybe we don't hear from that character again until like five chapters later, but I'll, I'll sort of keep that in mind or, or make a note of it somewhere that, hey, I gotta, I gotta remember to, to bring this through. And sometimes it just gets cut entirely. So, yeah. So, I guess I can say, when you're like, obviously, if you're doing multiple characters and different uh, chapters with, for each character, but if they're together, do you tr always try and make sure that even though, say, a character won't have like five chapters, but he's obviously in the room quite a lot with other people, do you still try and get that character to have? Little talky things, obviously, from his point, not from his point of view. You're hearing it from your 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 point of views, point of view. <laughs> so, <I'm> like, <laughs> so, character to who has the point of view character? You mean? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, normally, I, I at least this actually came up with the the book that I'm editing now, book five of Spacers. Uh, I I realized that there was a character that really should have been in a scene, but there's no mention of him at all. So I at least go back and make sure to like give him a little, little you know, line of dialogue, at least as a sort of roll call. Like, hey, hey, I'm here. Hey, guys. <laughs> He's participating. You know, <laughs> really, really make not to. So, yeah. And, you know, you try to make the dialogue actually contribute to the scene, too. That's always nice. If it, you know, I find I'm always trying to make things do double or even triple duty in a scene. So... You, you put things in and hopefully you're you're accomplishing more than, than one thing by including any given element. And uh, shout out to, to Frankie and Dustin in the chat. Good to see you guys. Yeah, I've just actually talked about StarCraft. 
He's, he's very right. I, I do. Frankie says, uh, Scott considers finding a Zen and arousing game of Starcraft. We, we played Starcraft recently. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Nice. Old school Starcraft, of course. And Brood War. Yeah, Brood War. Good old Brood War. Mm. Now, because this is something about your books that I like, is you had a lot of short chapters. There were some longer chapters, but there were quite a lot of short chapters. I know it seems like weird, but like, even though you read a chapter, 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 it does make a difference. But when you finish a chapter really quickly, it kind of feels like you've achieved something. So it's like, oh, chapter, another chapter. And like, that's something that I like. When I'm reading through chapters, I'm like, yeah, I've burned through loads of chapters, even though it's no difference if it was just one long one. But when I read a long chapter, I know it's a long chapter. It's a bit like, oh, I know I've got so much to read until I can stop. Mm. Also, I presume you've took that into, because um, you know, your chapters, they, you know, you do like well from, yeah, you do have shorter. They're not massive long chapters, are they? They're kind of, sure. you know. What I mean? Yeah, yeah. They tend to average around fifteen hundred words. Yeah. Um, that seems to be the sweet spot, like in terms of me writing them. I feel like I can pack in enough meat while still keeping the the story clipping along at a good pace. And uh, it seems to work well for the readers too. I've heard it referred to as sort of potato chip chapters. You know, they're they're easy to digest. Yes. And then, of course, by the time you make it to the end, there's that little hook waiting for you to sort of, you know, bring you into the next chapter, raises some sort of, of question or some sort of reversal or, or there's a hint of something to come or the character is in mortal peril or something that's going to make you want to continue turning the pages. And of course, with my books, I, I, more often than not, like I said, there's multiple POVs. So you often have to wait a few chapters to find out how that's resolved. So it's, I do find that helps with, with readability for sure. Cause when, so when, before I started actually trying to look at how to structure a, um, a story correctly for like chapter lengths and stuff like I've researched, I mean, this was a few years ago, but I'd look and like, they say like, Oh, the average, the perfect chapter, the average chapter is like 2,500 words. So I was like, okay. So like you're, you're trying to write 2,500 words and last thing, they've got to be 2,500 words, even though I know they, don't have to be because I read smaller and longer chapters, but I felt, oh, I just need to stop here. I'm trying, trying to think, oh, how can I make it bigger and, and stuff? And it's just, you don't have to go 2,500 words. You know, you can go 3,000, you can go 1,000. But like for new people who don't know what they're doing, like obviously I'm new and like I haven't got a clue what I'm doing, but like you, you kind of, you really sort of think, oh, I have to, you know, these are the boxes. You have to tick all these boxes, but you don't have to do that. It's, if it feels like the story stops there, stop there. Yeah, so it's a lot of like what works for you as an individual author and what the another big consideration is what what you think the story, you know, needs at, at a given time. So sometimes it's just going to be a quick a quick chapter, sort of like a roller coller chapter or something to briefly set something up for later on or maybe it's like a mysterious character that we don't know a whole lot about, so you don't want to reveal too much information about them. So we just give them into like a glimpse of say the antagonist's lair and we're yeah. given some intriguing details, but uh, you know, there's some dark portents that are going to come to fruition later on in the story. But right now we don't want to reveal our whole hand. So we're just going to get that little tidbit or maybe you've got a long action sequence that for whatever reason you feel like should be contained in this given chapter. I like to spread battles out over multiple chapters, but uh you know, there's a lot of reasons that you could have a longer chapter too. A lot of character development, maybe. Maybe you're delivering exposition through some sort of like meeting of, of the, the powers that be or the, the characters are trying to figure out or level up uh, in order to defeat the antagonist. So there's a lot of considerations there. And ultimately, uh, as a newer writer my, myself, like uh, back, you know, back when I was newer, uh, I found myself like looking for these, you know, what, what are these check boxes that I'm supposed to satisfy with the story and yes. I'm going to read like blogs or writer's digest or on writing or, or whatever, you know, it's like, you know, prescribe me some things of, of how to properly write a novel. But the more that I wrote and the, as I put out more books and, you know, immerse myself in more stories, I realized that uh, it, you really do have that blank canvas and that's both a beautiful thing and it can be a little intimidating, but uh which brings me to, I wanted to ask you, how do you, how do you tend to stay motivated, Joe? Do you, do you have any techniques? Um, oh, well, I think about it the night before or at the night. I think, well, what am I going to do tomorrow? And I sort of think about the little story and like, I kind of like get myself sort of into it. And then I kind of, I like to finish 
the last bit on a bit where I know I want to keep going as well, if you know what I mean. So, like, mm -hmm. sometimes I do, like, whether it's any good, because no one's ever seen it, but, like, sometimes I can do 2,000 words. Because if I have a real good day, I have, like, 2,000 words. Like, I get, like, two. I think I got one day I got, I can't add a little list up there while I was doing it. I think I made, sometimes I made, like, two, 3,000 words a day. I was kind of, like, that was, like, a little goal as well, sort of, like, this day I made this. Like, sometimes I only did, like, 300 words. I had a terrible day. I have like little set myself like little goals. Like, I'm gonna really hit. I want to hit the numbers. Hit the numbers. And because of the night before, I'm thinking this is gonna happen. This is the sort of scene, sort of to you know know what you're gonna do. And mm -hmm. I sort of like really try and get into it and go for it. And yeah, I don't know. Because I, I really love the universe that I've made up in my head. So it's not that's the other things I'm trying to you know get it down. It's just I, you know quite a few things really. <laughs> uh, okay, one of the things you said reminds me of. Uh... I think Hemingway gave this advice, and that's to leave a rough edge every time that you uh, stop writing for the day, because it's a lot easier to, like, I guess, uh, plaster onto a rough edge rather than a smooth, something like that. I'm probably yeah. totally butchering the anal analogy, but uh, yeah, you, you leave your something to sort of latch onto the next day and then build on. Well, why that's saying, because what I do is if I finish up a chapter, I know what. The next chapter is going to be because that's how my story is flowing. So I'll write like a few notes, a few little lines of like, I want this to happen, this to happen, this to happen, this to happen. So then I'll, I'll read the chapter, like, okay, right. And I might like read the last bit of the last chapter if it's a chapter flowing onto the next chapter. And I know, okay, so these are the points going to hit. And then it all sort of jogs back into my memory. And then I just go for it, really. Yeah, that's sweet. Yeah. Well, again, like it comes down to what works for a given writer. So I, I don't do the rough edge thing, for example. Uh, I just like, for some reason, having that like discrete unit of the chapter and beginning and ending with that, that's what seems to work best for me. But I, I have tried it and I can definitely see the appeal of, of that technique. We've got a little comment here, which I believe is for you. <laughs> yeah, if you're not going to find the, the whiteboard, Frankie, but uh, I can tell you that there are many sheets of uh, handwritten loose leaf in my closet. And I think there's stacks of them somewhere in the office. This is my little folder that I keep uh, whatever I'm working on right now. So that'll have all my like outlines and stuff. And uh, just open it up there. So yeah, there's like my plot skeleton there. I don't know if you can see that. And, uh, you know, ideas and stuff. Uh, there's the, I think I showed this last week. Uh, yes, before. your map. I drew that at, while I was at Starbucks, I think. <laughs> uh, here's another little diagram. Just flash that real quick. Make sure yeah. no one, no one They're going to go back and pause it. <laughs> Maybe for, uh, for spaces if you pause at that frame. But, uh, yeah. Right next to me, this is, this is what I've got. And it's like, I, I, it's like any time, like, so I know it's going to seem like I, I like to try and do things. What with my story? It's kind of I'm trying to make it as realistic as possible, set decently in the future. So like the way uh, ships fly and the, the uh, scope of space and stuff is as realistic as can be. But I've added technology which kind of still works realistically with what it, how it does and stuff. But like wait, wait. So the ships are like I've got all these ships and something how naval ships are they're named after like whether it's american or whatever like that they're named after something specific and all the ships will be the same sort of names and stuff so i want that sort of professional seriousness and it's only a small thing so then i have to write these are the ship classes find a load of names that will only go with them types of ships and then kind of just like write a bit of um, a law behind it just so i've always got a point to go back to just in case so then that mm -hmm. takes up a couple pages i've got ships names ship sizes all stuff that you probably won't always see in the story but it's there so i know so i don't make a mistake if you know what i mean like name of a ship and stuff because oh, wow. people pick that out you know <laughs> big time yeah, and it, as the series goes on it uh there's more and more to remember too i think we talked a, a bit about that last week but uh, I was going to say that that sort of world building you're doing and, and making sure that you're sort of building on top of accurate science and then, you know, going out on a little more of a limb, maybe with the, the other science. Yes. I, I think that pays off a lot when it comes to like reader immersion. Uh, it sort of reminds me of, of the way, I don't know if you're familiar with The Expanse. Yes. 
the way that they've gone about it. Like they start with the, it's all just the, the one solar system. They start with the, the extremely hard science and then they go out on a bit of a limb with you know the, the gates and stuff. And I won't get into too much of that because of spoilers for people, but uh, also similar to Game of Thrones too. I, I think one of the ways that that was able to, to hit the mainstream was they didn't hit you with the crazy fantasy magic stuff right That's away. It. it was very low, very low yeah. fantasy. Well, yeah, it was just grounded, believable. Yeah, that's it, grounded, yeah. Evil world. And then end of season one, surprise, there's dragons. They so, built into it, that's it, because they built into it slightly. You always knew there was going to be dragons there, but they didn't, it was until the end, you know, they're dragons. But even dragons, dragons isn't as crazy as some magic stuff that happens. Like some magic, you know, they do all sorts of crazy stuff. But like a dragon's kind of like an animal that's in fantasy, so you kind of expect it. True. You know, like, you know, like there, there is magic, which like they bring back someone from dead. But it's very low. It's not like they're wind, you know, um, waving the wands and beams going everywhere and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And I think that kind of like concrete detail and sort of playing your hand out slowly uh, I think it draws the reader in really effectively and it sort of sets the stage for if you do want to go out on a bit more of a limb later on, then the reader's going to be more forgiving of that because you have grounded them so concretely in the world. Yes. Right. Shall we move on to one of your next topics? What, yeah, do what one do you want to go for? Because we've done the motivated. So marketing. Market, well, do you want to go marketing first? Because marketing is before you start writing. And then we can then talk about the actual. Well, I didn't say that, but get into. Go on, you, you do what you want to do. It's your show. Okay. <laughs> so you're thinking, uh, talking about how marketing begins before you start writing? Yeah, go for that. Do it. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, and what, what I mean by that is um, you should really start thinking about your ideal reader before you, you ever start writing. Which also means, you know, you don't have to do that. Like I said before, really any approach is valid and also any any goal for your writing is valid maybe you're just writing for yourself maybe you're writing for your friends and family uh maybe you want to submit to some contests or maybe you want to try to make a full-time living of it as an indie writer i'm guessing we're here mostly to talk to people who are trying to make it as an indie writer so the way that i, that I went about it anyway is uh we, we touched on this briefly last week is to think about the market that you're going to target before you start writing. So, you know, it's not like, okay, I'm gonna come up with an idea, what maybe that idea fits into mystery, maybe it's more of a, a military fantasy, maybe it's more of a space opera. So no, you, you start with the genre. And as, as I mentioned last week, I, I chose the, uh, the right to market approach as described by Chris Fox in, uh, in a book called What Do You Know, Right to Market. And uh, in that he talks about, you know, you want to identify a subgenre, not just as a genre like sci-fi, but a subgenre like say, you know, military sci-fi, space marine. And the, the more you can drill down, the better because the less competition you're going to be and also the easier it is, it's going to be to define that readership and serve them properly. And so once you've located a subgenre that has low enough competition and high enough popularity that there's room for a newcomer to come and make a name for themselves, then you want to make sure if you're not already a fan of that genre, then you want to make sure to pick up, I would recommend at least six books in the genre and read them, not to copy them, but to see what reader expectations are in this genre. What are the, the tropes that readers expect to encounter in the genre and make sure that you are interacting meaningfully with those tropes and uh, satisfying reader expectations. And when I say interacting meaningfully, I don't mean you need to just regurgitate every single trope you come across. Uh, you know, you pick some of the tropes, the one that make most sense for your idea and for your story. And, you know, then you can ideally portray them at least in a new light and sometimes even subvert them as long as it's clear that you are interacting with story so yeah. otherwise your book isn't going to be able to be classed as this subgenre yes another thing is like get advertising straight away as well you know like try and get your name out there try and get a following kind of if whether you kind of join like a new writers group and you find like the sci-fi people in there and you know start a youtube channel talk about your book anything to get a few a bit of a name out there that's kind of 
part not the reason why I started this channel because originally I was just reviewing books, but it's gonna help. I hope it's gonna help. Of like you know my book because I, I talk about it a lot. I do this every week. I've just done that little um, the short story thing which I'm gonna try and do every week, which is about my universe and you know, try and build a little bit of fan base and then or a lot of the story. And then as soon as my book comes out, hopefully they'll be like, "Wow, it's amazing," or they'll just be like, "That's terrible." But you know, what I mean, just yeah, just try and get yourself out there. I, I think it's I think it's a good idea, and I, and I think the the work you're doing here, like not only are you building up an audience, but uh, the the networking you're you're doing too is invaluable. You know, bouncing ideas back and forth, exactly what like what we're doing here, and uh, and this benefits me just as much as it does you because you know it helps me to to talk through these things and. You know, we'll probably end up looking at it in, in, in some ways that I haven't considered either. But um, the other thing, too, is, is when it comes to promotion, especially in indie author circles, and this is something that I love about the indie author community, but uh, we don't look at it as a zero-sum game. Like, we, we acknowledge that readers are, are able to read more than one book, so it's not like if they read my books, they can't possibly read your books and vice versa, right? now they can yeah. read both. So, you know, we, we do have this sort of established practice of if you approach an author and th that author thinks that your, your books are going to be a good fit for their audience and they're professionally packaged and they, they can see that maybe even if you haven't published in the genre, they can see that you're clearly bringing something valuable to the table, then they're not going to hesitate to go and promote that to their audience, um, you know, whether it's via a newsletter or a Facebook boosted post or, or something like that, typically in exchange for you promoting their book at some point to your audience when it launches. Uh, you know, and if you're starting off, obviously you may not have much of a platform to do that. For example, you know, a lot of most most of us aren't born with newsletters. So uh, so you know that's something that you're gonna build as a, as an indie author. It's a, it's a big recommendation anyway. And this is a great tool when it comes to having something to sort of approach established authors and say, hey, I'm building this newsletter. Uh, I plan to build a, it even bigger off the back of my first release. I'd love it if you could mention this book to your readers and uh, I'll, I'll certainly do the same to you once, you're, once I have a platform and after my launch. Well, that's the whole thing. It's networking, like you said earlier. Like, you know, it, exactly, it's, uh, that's what I've been trying to do. Like, you know, I've learned so much without even having to make the first mistakes of putting my first book out and then realizing what not to do just by talking to other authors and like this works, this doesn't work. And then you can talk to like smaller publishing, like self publishing or publishing like groups like Chris Kennedy, someone I spoke to um, there's the free Ravens publishing and Canon publishing, like those guys who do them, like they've come on the channel and I've spoke to them and stuff and just learning what they do and how they work it and like how they advertise and get their books out and get the names about and just, you know, all rise together. And I, I'm always sharing other people's books and trying to, you know, not that no one on my Facebook would actually buy much of these sort of books, but I do it anyway, you know, try and help them. It's just, yeah, that's, Totally. And, uh, it goes a long way. And uh, if I can think of, you know, if I can name one lesson that's probably the most important when it comes to networking over the years is always front load, like always provide value first. So, you know, don't, don't go to an author and say, you know, hey, can you promote my book? Oh, can yeah. No, no, no. First, well, first think about what you can do for them. You know, can, can you put it out to your, your limited audience? Can you get in touch with them and say you really like the book? Maybe leave them a review. Uh, that kind of thing. You know, think about what kind of value stuff like you're doing. You know, like ha having having people on your show and it, it gives that it gives me, for example, something that I can then go and share with my readers. And it's a bit of a win win, right? So you're providing value up front, and when you do that, people are going to remember it and be more willing to, to help you out when the time comes. So I, I see a lot, a lot of people going to people and just it's all about the, the ask, like, how can you help me? And uh, would you be interested in helping me? It's a lot more effective if you go to people, you know, do what like Joe is doing and provide what value you can up front and build the relationship so that when your book does come out, these people already know you, they like you, they appreciate what you have been able to do for them. And they're going to be a lot more inclined to, to help you out. 
I agree. I do. We have another comment here. Um, here we go. So, uh, do you want to answer this one first, Joe? Oh, you go for it. I think this is targeted to you. I'm mine is still new, so. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just trying to think. No, I mean, not really. The only, know reason, what? The, only reason I, the only reason I would regret it is if it didn't serve the story. So I've never, I've never been like, oh, that character was a bit too much or anything like that. Like nothing's, nothing's too much. <laughs> You know, I've put the most, you know, negative, horrible, sociopathic, psychopathic characters in my story. And uh, it just makes for good stories. <laughs> so not, never anything like that. So the, really the, the way that I would look at that question is, have I ever put in a personality that didn't serve the story? Nothing, nothing really comes to mind. I, I think it's sort of a natural process that if a character has a personality that's interesting enough, at least to me, but then that character is naturally going to become more prominent in a story because because they're interesting and they're going to move the narrative further better. So I, I guess the answer is no. But if I if I think of anything, uh, I'll, I'll I'll let you know. <laughs> if anything comes well, to mind. I have I completely forgot about this. So I've got a character called Franklin Griffin. He's he's a fleet admiral. Um, and he's a point of view character. Now, just a bit of context to my story. My story set in the distance, distance future. So you're talking over multiple, multiple galaxies. Like there's a whole web of FDL and all this blah, blah, whatever. But so fleet admirals isn't as like what our fleet admiral is. Like there's millions of fleets across these galaxies of galaxies. So fleet admiral's just a fleet admiral, you know what I mean? But I, the way I've made him, I've kind of gone for that he's a bit of a dick slash uh, narcissist he's kind of about me i i i not caring about other people and i was trying to make him sort of break down and not he doesn't make mistakes because he, what he's up against is really hard but it he kind of thinks more about himself than other things i'm trying to make him the way i'm trying to make him i don't know whether he would be believable to because obviously the military people are going to read this They'll be like, hmm, a fleet admiral wouldn't really be like that. And that's kind of like a bit like, oh, it's kind of in the context of the story, whether I can make him believable for the context of the story to like if they try and compare it to real life because it would be so not believable, if you know what I mean. That's kind of like something I've struggled with. Because oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. it couldn't hurt to to find some, you know, some uh, people who have served, to, especially in the Navy, to, to run and buy them. Yes, and, uh, I, I guess officers would, would mostly be the ones to have interactions with, with admirals. But uh, I mean, I think you can make it work. Uh, people climb the the rungs of power and the ranks for for various reasons. Mm. Not, not all of those reasons are going to be 100 percent pure and noble. So uh, and it also depends a lot about you know the culture of your story and uh, the time that it's set in, the setting, so on. So. Uh, I definitely always err on the side of getting feedback from yes. you know, veterans or, or, or uh, current, current current serving uh, members of the military. I but, have uh, spoke to one guy, and he did. I explained it a bit more detail because it kind of wasn't very detailed what I explained. It. And he kind of said he can buy it. He did. He, he wasn't like no. He was kind of like if it goes with a story, it's believable for the context yeah. of the story. He can get it. But for me, who's not a military person, this is part of what I was talking about we're trying to get ship names right and stuff like oh I wanted the I'm writing military and I want to try and do it correct as correct as I can because I respect it. So that's mm. kind of about the whole admiral thing is like it's a cool I think it's a cool story and everything that's happening but I've never had a deal with that. But then there's like I said admiral fleet admirals there's loads of them. There's you know what I mean like because of the size because of the size of my universe there's loads of them about so it's not as a rare thing as nowadays that's you know that's kind of my thing yeah uh, i mean my instinct would be to say you can probably make it work yeah. uh, but uh the more feedback you can get from the more different people the that's better. It. well there's my answer to that question there we go we have another question we'll do another question unless another question comes up then we'll get into some of the other things but there we go right on so yeah i mean 
I guess my general answer to this question would be if there's not an established category on Amazon for something, like if you if you if you if there isn't a genre or a subgenre on there that you can identify that has clearly definable tropes that the current reader of that genre is responding to, then you're gonna have more of an uphill battle than someone that's writing, you know, say dystopian sci-fi, which is clearly defined or space opera or alien invasion or whatever like that that's clearly a viable readership that's doing well on amazon and, and you'll notice i'm speaking from a very amazon centric perspective and that's because i'm largely exclusive to amazon so that's mostly what i know and uh you know we can go into the question of exclusivity versus why at some point if you want and why i've gone that route but uh Anyway, having said all that, I don't think it's impossible. I think you can find a readership for pretty much anything. Uh, I do think it always pays off to, to study what your target market and target audience would be for a given project and to interact with that audience as much as you can before tackling it and certainly before launching and marketing it. But uh, you know, you, you want to experiment even use facebook ads or something to a b test say titles and book descriptions and uh couldn't hurt to send the first few chapters out to your prospective readers but uh you can get creative and there's a number of ways to market something online maybe you do something totally depend independent of the amazon algorithm maybe you don't uh, rely on amazon's recommendation algorithm at all maybe you're building a following on Instagram, or maybe you've started a YouTube channel on this topic, or maybe you have a blog on this topic. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a number of different ways to get creative with marketing and uh, sort of carve out your own niche. I, I, I'm never going to say anything is impossible when it comes to uh, trying something that's a little outside the box. You're going to have more of an uphill battle, but it, I, think, I think it's possible. I think if you're going to do something that's quite niche. You need to have a bit of reading in it yourself, you know, to know what you like to then be like, Oh, I like that story. I want to go into it. Cause it's really niche. You don't, you don't want to be kind of like, I've never written that. I've never wrote in that um, or uh, read that. I'm just going to go and do it. You know, it's kind of, you've got to kind of know, know it a bit to want to invest into it. Cause also yeah. writing, you know, yeah. yeah. I think there's this instinct too. When writers started out, I certainly had this instinct to be as creative and original and out of the box as you possibly can. And uh, you, know, you don't want to be combined by genre constrictions and tropes and uh, expectations and things like this, uh, which is awesome. I think it's a perfectly valid thing to try to do. I, I think it's great. You know, Harry Potter was a pretty new idea when it came out, so it can also work out quite spectacularly. But in terms of maximizing your chances of success as a new author, I do think the, the right to market approach is, is the best approach for giving yourself the best shot. So identifying a viable genre and researching it, and, you know, using your work to satisfy those reader expectations while remaining original and bringing something fresh to the table within that framework. So that's my two cents on it. Yeah, that's a good two cents. Now, why about Amazon? Do you not publish on anything else than all the other platforms or, or, yeah, go for it. I have, and, and I do a little bit. And wow. my main reason these days for going wide, as they say, uh, you know, other distributors like Apple Books or Kobo or uh, Google Play Books, which I'm not sure if that's even a thing anymore. <laughs> Gribbed, and there's a bunch of them. Yeah. But my, my main reason for, for going to them at all now is to get a, what's, what's called a book bub. You're familiar with book bub? Are you familiar with the Joe or with BookBub? Is that the, the thing on Amazon where like you get the... So BookBub is a, sort of like a, it's, it's like a, a paid newsletter. So, right, okay. Well, yeah, they built, they built up a newsletter. They're, they're probably the biggest one. They are the biggest one in the space. Okay. Millions of subscribers and they're also extremely choosy. So you have to basically, you don't just like buy a newsletter spot from them. You have to essentially apply for it and you're, if you're just in Kindle Unlimited, which if you're in Kindle Unlimited, then you're exclusive to Amazon, it's a requirement, uh, then your your chance of getting a book, Bob, is a lot lower. 
but getting getting a book bub is great exposure for a book. Like you typically expect to see hundreds of sales on like a 99 cent book that day. Usually they're either discounted to 99 cent or free too. So anyway, that's why I go wide these days is to uh, get book bubs. The reason why I'm largely exclusive to Amazon is reason number one, and it is the main reason. So it's, uh, it's mostly why I do it is Kindle Unlimited. And uh, so the way the Amazon algorithm works is uh, your, your sales rank determines your visibility. So the, the book with sales rank number one in the Kindle store is the most visible book and it's selling the best out of all the books. Uh, so every time you, you make a sale, your sales rank bumps up a bit. So it's a, Amazon is, is a true meritocracy in that sense. Sales are directly equivalent to visibility. Um, but another thing that increases your, your visibility is boros under Kindle Unlimited. So we're not sure if they're equivalent to sales or not. I'm pretty sure that they're pretty close anyway. But anytime anyone borrows your book in Kindle Unlimited, that also bumps it up. So, and, and about half of your revenue when you're in Kindle Unlimited will come from Kindle Unlimited versus direct sales. So when you're not in Kindle Unlimited, when you, you're wide on the other retailers, then on Amazon, you've cut your chances to ascend yeah. through the ranks in half, essentially. And typically, most authors find, this isn't the case across the board, plenty of authors are making good livings being wide, but a, a lot of authors anyway have found that being wide does not make up for the sales that they've lost on Amazon, the visibility they've lost on Amazon through being in Kindle Unlimited. Another thing I'll say about the other retailers is whereas Amazon is a true meritocracy, uh, on the other retailers, you have to either have a relationship with the merchandising team in order to get visibility, or you have to pay for visibility, and it's also a lot harder to sustain. The recommendation mm -hmm. algorithms aren't as robust as Amazon's. So Amazon is just a lot more indie friendly for someone who's not a traditional publisher with, with a massive budget to throw behind books and without relationships with merchandising teams and, and, and all these things. Uh, Amazon is just a lot more receptive ecosystem for us to go and sort of uh, have our books. So you might as well put all your eggs in the Amazon basket because they're just more the they're the by far the most hospitable to indie authors. So that's why I'm Amazon exclusive. I'm going to ask a question which might seem really dumb, and this is something that I don't know. As much research as I've been trying to do, you've just come out with something. So that book bump, yeah. So you said if you're not, if you're under the the Amazon Kindle Unlimited thing, you've got lesser chance to get in on that. Yeah. So what's stopping you from going with a book bump first, getting with them, doing that, then sign up to Kindle Unlimited, or are you not allowed to? Nothing stopping you from doing that. That's exactly what I do, actually. <laughs> okay. So 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 basically, you can still go. It's obviously a lot of work. To sign up to all these different things, but you want to stage it and stagger it. Yeah. Well, there's a service actually called Draft Two Digital. It's draft numeral two digital.com and they're an aggregator. So you just need, you do need to create an EPUB versus a Mobi. So an EPUB is the file format that uh, pretty much all the other ebook retailers use, whereas Amazon uses the Mobi, their proprietary format. But uh, Scrivener does this really well. Uh, one of the reasons I really like Scrivener is that it, it exports all these different files that you need. So you just export your, your EPUB, you upload it to draft it digitally, you put in the metadata, the title, the keywords, the description, whatever else, upload the cover. And you only need to do that once. And then the draft, draft it digital will distribute your ebook to all its ebook retailer partners. Okay. And they'll take a cut for that, of course, but it's pretty convenient. So that's that's what I use. If you don't mind me asking, what is the cut they take? If you don't uh, mind I believe it's 10%. Okay, well, that's not for the time you save because you know it could be a few days doing all them things if you know have to, you know, yeah, and like you know, that's two chapters in theory, mm. you know, it's kind of yeah. And if I was wide, like if, if going wide was more of a strategy for me, I, I, I would consider going to the different retailers and uploading specifically to each one, yeah. And in, in an ideal world where you are 
uh, wide. You want you kind of want to learn all the different retailers almost as well as you learn Amazon because yeah. you want to you know figure out what it takes to succeed in each ecosystem. That's also a lot of work, and we got to write books. So yes, that's the thing is kind of you got to balance the whole. You can put so much time in the admin, and then you're not writing books. You're not getting the books out. So exactly. yeah. And like I said, for someone like me, where why it just isn't a big part of my marketing strategies, not worth it at all. For the for like the, the couple of weeks or so that I'm gonna be wide, I just put it on draft to digital. It makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for answering that for me. All right, right next next one. I said we're at 45 minutes, so we might have enough time. Well, we, we can go over an hour, it's not a problem, but it's up to you. Um what do you want to talk about next? How to structure on launch or how to get the elements in place for self-publishing? Well, I think we kind of... No, we didn't really. Go on. I'll leave it in your hands. I'll drink. <laughs> I'll, I'll touch on the, I guess, the elements of uh, self-publishing because I guess it makes sense to do that in chronological order. You're going to need to self-publish first or you're going to need to get the pieces in place before you launch. That's it. Uh, and... Uh, Mainly what I wanted to say there is uh, obviously the, the basic elements of self-publishing are you're going to need cover art, you're, you're going to need editing of some kind. Uh, what else? Uh, I guess audiobook narration. Really, there aren't many pieces. <laughs> Formatting is, is another one. Uh, typography, if you're going to hire someone separately to do that, but often cover artists will do typography as well. So the the way to find professionals to do all these things or a good way is to go to somewhere like uh, kboards.com and uh, this is uh, specifically the writers cafe sub forum this is a place where a lot of indie authors hang out and talk shop and because professionals know that indie authors hang out there uh, they'll often come and hang their shingle and then they'll come and create a thread for their services and say hey i'm a cover artist Here's my portfolio. Check out my work if you think it suits what you're looking to do. Get in touch. Uh, another cool thing about this is you'll often find a lot of comments in these threads from writers who have worked with these professionals, you know, saying what it was like to work for them and how they find the work and, and so on. So that's pretty convenient. And you can also reach out to these people in the comments or ask the professional specifically for some references and, you know, just to get a better idea of the, the quality of their work and what their process is and how many revisions they do, for example, for cover art and, and things like that. Uh, there are other places. I think uh, D Dustin in the chat recommended a place that I can never remember the name of, but it might be called Writer's Sanctum or, or something like that. And Dustin, uh, if you're still here, to, if you could drop that in the chat for us, that'd be awesome. Uh, I, can't, I can't see it. I don't think the comments come up for me yet. Uh, I clicked on it to the right. I can see co there's comments in private chat. And yeah, and no, I've got the comments because, but I haven't. That comment hasn't popped up for me yet. Oh no, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, oh, there we go. Oh, there's I a Reddit. Know, I know Dustin, so he's told me before. That, oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. And Dustin says Reddit self publishing sub is growing, so that's probably another great place to go and look for these professionals. There you go. That's that one. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, and if you like, you know, obviously this is going to require some sort of a budget and, uh, you know, maybe you don't have the, uh, the, the, but the budget necessarily to put into self-publishing right now. Another thing you can look at is, uh, some of these professionals will barter for their services and a lot of them are writers themselves. So like maybe it's a cover artist who's also a writer and you're a writer who's able to edit. So maybe you offer editing in exchange yes. for the cover art that they give. So really, I mean, the main ingredient in this game is how much you're willing to hustle. And if you don't have the budget, then just hustle more. And, <laughs> you know, put in, put in the time and tr use what you got, you know, trade your skills for other people's skills. And, you know, you can do this. You can put it together. You well, this kind out. of comes back to, like, what we were talking about earlier, kind of about, like, the networking side of thing. Like, if you get in with authors, you can find out who are, um who are good at editors where to find nice good editors who are reliable because so many out there you don't know who to go with and like you say this is good this this person really specializes in sci-fi or romance or whatever you're into and like same as this artist here he does he's good you might not know this artist blah 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 because he doesn't put his name out but he's really good go with this one you know yeah and a lot of times writers don't openly advertise who they use 
yeah. like cover art or whatever else, mainly because they're afraid that other writers will then come up and, and book up their schedule and they won't be able to get them anymore. I think that's the main reason for it. <laughs> so like you say, if you're networking with other writers and they know you, they're like, hey, you know, here's this guy, he's really good. Uh, my cover artist is Tom Edwards, so I, I'm not I'm not smart enough to use that defense. <laughs> I recommend Tom; he's awesome. His but, work is uh, really really good. Yeah, like, really. A while ago, I wanted him to do a piece of art for me for the mm. YouTube thing that I was doing, but um, I mean, then like I funds went downhill, and then the coronavirus all kicked off, and it all went downhill completely. And he's like, right, well, that's not going to happen. Um, yeah, but it, it, oh, his art's so good. His ships and that are amazing work. It's, yeah, oh, he's yeah, good I'm artist. Right. Really good artist. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his work, which is uh, yeah, it's pr pretty pretty sweet to have it represent in my books. Definitely. So, uh, right, are you finished with that bit? Was there any more that you want to talk about? Yeah, I'd say that's the long and short of uh, what I had to say on that. Perfect. That's Jim. We might squeeze all in an hour. Last bit then. Last bit on your little your little tick list. Hmm. Okay. Uh, which is structuring the launch, right? Uh, yes, that's it. Cool, yeah. So, so the main goal of, and again, I'm, I'm speaking from a, an Amazon-centric perspective here, as always, but uh, the main goal of structuring a launch on Amazon would be to take advantage of the Amazon algorithm. And what I mean by that is the, the best thing that you can possibly make happen for your book is, for, is to get the algorithm to promote it for you mostly via book recommendations that they send out to readers. And the way that you accomplish that is exactly what we've been talking about. So making sure that you are, have identified your genre, that your book is clearly belonging to that genre and is also packaged in a way that clearly signals to the reader that it belongs to that genre. Uh, so that's the groundwork you gotta do. That's the foundation you have to build. Then when it comes to actually launching, you need to demonstrate to the algorithm in a sense that that is what you've done. So on day one of your book launch, the last thing you wanna do is throw it on Facebook or social media in general and have your, your relatives and friends and their dogs go up, pile on Amazon and buy the book yep. because that is incredibly confusing to the Amazon algorithm. The reason for that is the, the, the way that the Amazon recommendation algorithm works is that uh, it, it tracks customers' buying histories. So what you actually want for, you know, for example, in military fantasy, you want to, especially early on in your launch, you want to only and narrowly sell your book to fans of that genre who, whose reading histories are almost entirely populated by military fantasy books, like the, the true fans, right? Whereas if you, if you, you know, promote it to your relatives and everyone wants to get on pile on and support you and they'll buy your book. That's like a hodgepodge of buying histories that the algorithm that you're now feeding the algorithm. The other algorithm get, gets confused. It can't clearly define the type of customer that's going to enjoy this book. And therefore it just gives up. It's like, I, I don't know, I don't have any clear data. I don't know who to market this to. So yeah. I'm not gonna do anything for this book. And that's when your book tanks, like the day after you do that usually. So instead, what you want to do is you want to, first of all, the most targeted sales that you can get are or organic sales. So if, you, if you've done your job well, if you've identified a market that's low competition enough that and high popularity enough that the, the readers are hungry for the genre, they're, they're combing the genre for new reads, you know, they're, they're, uh, they don't, there's not currently enough content on there to satiate the, the most hardcore fans of this genre then you're gonna get organic sales. They're just gonna randomly find your book because you've given it a title and a cover and a book description and a first chapter that just screams that it's the kind of book that they love. It's gonna draw them in, you're gonna see the organic sales. These are the most targeted possible sales you can get for your book. Then you wanna use something like Facebook ads or ideally Amazon ads and you, Amazon, actually BookBub's really good for this too, BookBub ads. So it's the same platform I mentioned before except it's, these aren't the ads that you have to apply for to get into their newsletter. This is uh, ads at the bottom of their email and it works in a similar way to Facebook ads and AMS ads. So it's like a self-serve ad platform. So BookBub ads and, and Amazon ads, AMS ads are, are really good for this, for narrowly targeting books 
that are exactly like the kind of book that you're looking to promote. So, you know, fans of this space opera book with a giant spaceship on it is clearly going to love my book, which is a, a space opera with a giant spaceship on it. Yes. That, you know, uses similar tropes and, and meets the expectations of, of this genre. And after that, you, you do that for a few days, and then you want to gradually expand out, gradually expand your targeting. Still don't want to put it on social media. You know, ideally, you've built up some kind of list. For example, for me, uh, I have a list where I know where each subscriber has come from. I, I use ConvertKit's tag system so that when someone signs up, for what for through one of my books, I know what series they've come from. So I have a list for that's after the galaxy. I have a list for mothership. I have a list for spacers and extra props and all that stuff. And when I'm launching a new book, I'll think about okay, which of my lists is most targeted for this book? Is it mostly alien invasion? Is it a military sci-fi space opera? Like which which of my series that I've put out before is closely matched to this book? And I'll, I'll first send it to that list because I know that that's the best data to give to the algorithm in terms of buying histories and stuff. And then you gradually expand out and then you eventually go broader, send it to your general list at some point and then go to social media. So long story short, you want to st start very narrowly. You want to train the algorithm about the ideal customer uh, for your book, who it, it's going to want to promote the book to going forward in, in order to get the highest conversion rate. And then you gradually expand out from there. So hopefully that made sense. That was, that was a lot of rambling and possible, possibly technical gobbledygook. So let me know if, if any of that was. That was amazing. No, that's that's really really good information because like basically to, to make it to sum it down, it's like if you just overload it, you'll have a massive spike. Because I've seen other people talk about it. you have a massive spike on the first and second day, and it goes flat pretty much because like it's just been overloaded. Even the same as sales, if you show all your fans in one hit they'll just buy it on the first few days and then the sales just tank because there's nothing else where you're because you're staggering it you know you're showing the, these little group of fans and these group of fans and like because you're staggering it out and you haven't like blah blah because blah. you're staggering it it's got a good ripple a constant ripple effect over a long time now i've seen other channels talking about that like you want to ripple over the entire time because mm -hmm. um, this is something that um with um pre-orders which can hurt your book if you do pre-orders all your fans and people buy it in advance as soon as it sails you have a big spike and then no no one's bought it because they bought it in that one period you mm. want that constant ripple so Amazon be like right this is selling over a long time we're going to invest our time into promoting this because there's a longer period of buying right pre-orders actually aren't that bad i think the main problem with pre-orders on amazon is that uh, it doesn't count towards the algorithm for launch, like it counts whenever they bought it. So you're kind of diluting your efforts a little bit. I think that's yeah. the main concern. So if, like, if you have your book up for pre-order for over two months, for example, and a lot of your readership buys it during those two months and it's like spread out like a thin sort of jelly across the surface of the Amazon algorithm, then you're, you're sort of, you, you don't have that punch during launch week. Yeah. Uh, pre-orders, like if they're the right length and, and you do them properly, that they can actually be a good way to generate what we're talking about, like that, you know, the slow ripple effect and slowly yeah. training the algorithm who likes to buy this book. And then by the time uh, the book launches, then you have what are called the also bots in place. These are, uh, if you look on a, on a book's product page, it's uh, customers who bought this also bot. And the, this is this section is like your main signal about whether you've done your job correctly in terms of targeting your book. So if, if one, you know, pre-order can help you have that in place by the time you launch. But once that also bot section gets in place and you look at it and it's all books that are in a similar genre to yours and it makes logical sense that someone who is going to be into reading your book would also have bought these books, then you've done your job well. But if you, you know, if you're writing uh, I don't know, military fantasy, and you've got some romance and thrillers and sci-fis and the also bots, now you've got a problem. And the al algorithm is probably extremely confused and it's not going to have any idea who to promote your book to. Cool. Do you know, so much information I just got from you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I, I deep thought about this stuff, so it's, I, love, I love rambling on about it.
well, this is it. Just this helped me, and hopefully, it's helped other people. Gonna, you know, watch this. Like, just just that staggering thing that you said. You know, like obviously, it wouldn't affect me now because I haven't got them fan people, you know, fans and the people who I can targetly sell stuff to. But down the line, if it works, like you know, yeah, sell to this. To give you an example, like when I launched Super Carrier, which is my most successful book to date. Uh, I had a newsletter, but I didn't have any kind of newsletter in the genre. So you might as well say I had no newsletter at all. And uh, I actually had that up for pre-order, I think, two or three weeks at least. It might have been longer. And I just used, it was actually Facebook ads at the time, and I targeted Space Marine and military sci-fi. And it was just a, a trickle. It started off as a trickle of sales, and I was experimenting with copy and making sure I was narrowly targeting it. And uh, slowly went on and, you know, one sale a day turned into three, turned into five. And by the time I was launching, I was getting 20, 30 sales a day. So it's like you could see that uh, algorithm, algorithmic effect in, uh, happening. You could see the algorithm slowly learning and, and slowly seeing who this book's, book appeals to. And, uh, you know, the fact that I had no pr uh, platform may have actually been a benefit to me at that time because it prevented me from just scatter shotting it to everyone mm -hmm. and it made sure that I, I was doing that narrow targeting by default and i was training the algorithm by default whereas if i had a platform i may have bungled it you know i may have inadvertently sent it to a bunch of readers who aren't really into the genre they were just going to confuse the algorithm so never let the fact that you don't have a platform discourage you or hold you back it's uh, it's absolutely possible especially with the way the Amazon algorithm works to, to if you've done your job correctly in targeting the type of reader that that's going to love your book, if you've packaged it correctly, if you've given it, given it the right title and book description, then you are going to see uptake. Uh, the, the other thing I'll mention in relation to all this stuff, uh, book description is by far the most important. Just a little, little, little tidbit there. Uh, I think it's like, it's at least 65% of readers who have discovered my work did so because of the book description. I survey my readers on an, ongo on an ongoing basis and 65% plus started reading my books because of the book descriptions. So, and I've seen that corroborated from other reader survey results that I've seen. So uh, you cannot spend too much time on your book description. It's, it's time well spent crafting that and learning how to write a good book description and, uh, and dialing that in. Uh, I think we're probably at time. I could talk about the what makes a good book description, but maybe we'll save that for, for another time. Yeah, yeah, well, oh yeah, because you can just come back again. I'm happy for you to come yeah. back. Okay. I've got no problem. I've got no problem with that. I am. Um, I find enjoyed. <laughs> and I've learned so much. Thank you. I've got. I've got lists of all sorts of stuff going on there. You can't say. Excellent. Ah, I love it. Oh yeah, I've got loads of stuff. I've all, all the the links and stuff. I've um I've got for myself. I'll try and add them in the description, or I'll have to get you to send me the links. And I'll put them in the description. Looks like we got oh, a question oh, from Corgan. Oh, here we go. We've got a. There we go. Welcome, Corgan, good to see you. Uh, so Corgan asked, "How how do you remedy that?" So, if you put your book out and you've done the scatter shot thing, then it's it's going to be hard. Uh, from what I've observed, and and, I, and obviously, the Amazon algorithm is ultimately a black box. Like none of us really know how it actually works. So this is all mm -hmm. speculation and theory, but. A lot of very smart people have been observing it over the years. You know, people like Chris Fox, who have freely shared this information in, in books and YouTube videos and stuff. By the way, Chris Fox's channel is another great one if you haven't checked it out. But um, yeah, so from what I've seen and what I've heard, if you have launched a book and done that scattershot effect, it's going to be very hard to sort of rehabilitate the book after that. It's it's a little bit set in stone and. The algorithm is probably, you know, it's kind of brutal to say, but it's probably given up on your book at that point. The, the earliest data seems to be the most important, which is why I say you know, during the first few days, you want to narrowly target it. Corgan, if you have launched a book and you, you think that this has happened for you, what you might consider is maybe getting a new cover for it uh, and do a, doing a relaunch. And it doesn't have to be a new cover. A new cover helps. Maybe you do another editing pass, maybe you add some bonus content. Like maybe it's like, there, there's a, a lot of different reasons or a lot of different ways you can justify a relaunch. Typically you want to give readers something new every time you do this. 
but um, you, you could relaunch it is what I'm trying to say. Del you know, delete it from your from your Amazon account, unpublish it, and then relaunch it and try it anew. And if the book, if this has happened to your book, it's probably not going to matter much anyway. Like, but if you like, if this has happened, you probably haven't sold that many copies. Or, you know, in my experience, and I've done this many times, I have, I think it was my eighth book that caught on online. So that's seven books whose, whose launch I, I bungled before that. But uh, chances are you have a book that, that has happened to you, it hasn't sold that many copies. So it's not going to matter that much if you relaunch it. You know, maybe, maybe put new cover art on it, maybe you do an author's note or something. Uh, one final note I'll say on that is uh, bringing up Chris Fox again, mainly because he, he's given such a wealth of, uh, content out. He does have a book on relaunching books and series. I can't quite remember what it's called right now, but if you check out the, I believe it's the Write Faster, Write Smarter series, that's a series of nonfiction books. It's one of those. And once you see the title, I'm sure you can't miss it. You'll immediately know which one I'm talking about. So if this is something that you're, that you're dealing with Corrigan and you're looking to relaunch a book, then I recommend reading that book. I think it's like five or six bucks. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, before we go, would people press the like button? Believe it or not, that helps the YouTube algorithm. Um, Match that like button. Yeah, do you know what it is? So, like, I put as many tags in all the videos, and like, usually at the front it's called Sci Fi Booktube and all this stuff. If you go on Google, uh, YouTube, so search Sci Fi Booktube, you have stuff come up well before my channel pops up with sci-fi booktube which is the name of the video and mm -hmm. like the stuff about like fancy this blah 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 and like military this something like that it's like but my, i've started in sci-fi booktube and the video is <laughs> called sci-fi booktube what is because like the comments and clicks and, and likes and stuff really do count and help um yeah. well, i will say when you search scott bartlett sci-fi on youtube our interview last week is the first thing that comes up Nice, that's good. See, when I search it, it's like the sixth one down or something. Really? Hmm. Yeah, like that's it. I put in Scott Bartlett and it come up with a load of people putting up your books. <laughs> I don't know if you're, you know they're on there, like all these books. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, there's all the there. Started, I mean, I, I could remove them, I could easily get them removed, but uh, I, I look at it as free, free publicity. It really because the thing is, these people are always going to do it, they're never going to stop. Exactly. You know, if you delete it, they'll just put it up again. But it gets your name out. Then people might see it, but like, oh, this is good. I'm going to buy into this, and then you know. Yeah. Whereas if you go on a big crusade against people who are pirating, then you're alienating that entire uh, group of readers. While a certain percentage of people who pirate will go on if they read enough of your stuff and like you enough, mm -hmm. like your work enough, they will go on to actually give you money for your work. So why why would I? cut myself off at the heels and, you know, totally rob myself of this avenue of publicity and alienate those people who will support me at some point down the road just to have the short-term satisfaction of sending a DMCA or something. No, well, some people just want to sample something. So they might listen to one book mm, and be like, I yeah. do like this. and Because I know I've not so much looked for that, but I look for, like, reviews of some books. If I'm, like, mm, I don't know, like, you know what I mean, or on board sometimes, I'll look at reviews on certain books, see what other people are saying, and I'll go into it. Some people might do the same, but, like, oh, Scott Barlett, this book, that pops up. But, oh, I'll listen to that. I like that. I mean, yeah. you know. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of reasons why people pirate, and studies show that people who pirate are also the biggest consumers. So, like, you know, people pirate music a lot, they're also the ones who buy – most music people buy our books a lot they're also the biggest book buyer so you're literally if you go after them you're literally alienating the exact people who are helping you pay your bills so this is not a good idea <laughs> no i completely agree um yeah, one last thing i'm gonna put my link in here this is the video that i've just done if you guys would have a look on that tell me if you like it comment if you think it's terrible please do because the first one i've ever done and yeah other than that Thank you, Scott, for coming on. I appreciate that. I've got Thank loads of information, as I said. There you go. You can see a bit more. Some of that's the script, but the rest of it's all information. Um, again, at some point, whenever. Thank you, people who have been commenting. Thank you for being here and watching. We've had, we had a solid few people. Like usually, I have about like four to five people. We had eight at one point. It peaked out. It's quite good. Um, Thanks for coming, guys. Really appreciate yeah. it. Appreciate it. And Scott and everyone, thank you very much. And uh, 